Hello and welcome to our webinar, Biography and Self-Telling in Dante, with esteemed Professor Elisa Brilli. My name is Veronica Manson and I'm the director of the Italian Cultural Institute in Toronto. This year marks the 700th anniversary of Dante Alighieri's passing. The anniversary is commemorated in Italy and abroad with a year-long series of conferences, readings, performances, films, and concerts to celebrate Dante's legacy and influence throughout the century. Today's webinar is organized by the Istituto Italiano di Cultura in Toronto in collaboration with the University of Toronto Department of Italian Studies. The webinar is part of a series of lectures and events organized also by the entire network of Italian cultural institutes in the US and Canada. And I would like to acknowledge the support of my colleagues, Francesco Darelli at the Italian Cultural Institute in Montreal, Emanuela Mendola with the Instituto in Washington, Luigi De Vito in Chicago, Anna Maria Di Giorgio in San Francisco, Valeria Rumori with the Italian Cultural Institute in Los Angeles, and Fabio Finotti, the newly appointed director of the Instituto in New York, and Paolo Barlera. Now, before starting our talk, I would like to mention an ongoing event called Toronto Salutes Dante, which is a tribute to Dante's poetry organized by the University of Toronto in collaboration with this institute. And it's, uh, it's a tribute to Dante's poetry through multi-language readings of Dante's verses in more than 30 different languages from Italian to its various dialects to languages from all five continents. And for the first time also in the indigenous Canadian language Anishina Bemowin. The project started last March 2025, which is Dante D, and it will continue until June 30th, when the Canadian writer Margaret Atwood will conclude the series with her special reading. So I do invite you to check out the YouTube channels of the Department of Italian Studies at the universities. You can also find the link by visiting our homepage at the East Italian Cultural Institute. They will uh, direct you to, the, to that page. Now, Dante's choice of language to write the Divine Comedy was revolutionary for its time. He chose to write in Italian instead of Latin. Now, Latin was considered until then the language for higher culture and literature. Italian was considered vulgar by that, meaning that it was the language of the common people, the populace. Dante in the De Vulgari Alquenza defended the Italian language as a noble language that could and should be used to write higher poetry and works of literature just as much as Latin was. So that's why it's one of the reasons why his legacy is so profound and his influence has impacted the, the Western literature throughout the centuries until now. Today's lecture is in according to the mission of celebrating the legacies of Dante's work, will delve into Dante's biography. So without further ado, I would like to introduce to you our speaker for today, Professor Elisa Brilli. Thank you, Professor, for being with us today. I would like to provide our viewers with some brief biographical information about Professor Brilli. Um, professor, you are currently Associate Professor of Italian Studies at the Department of Italian Studies and the Center for Medieval Studies at the University of Toronto. Now, you previously worked at the School for Advanced Studies in Social Sciences in Paris and the Kunst Historisch Institute in Florence, the Université du Québec in Montreal, École Pratique des Hautes Études, and at the University of Zurich in Switzerland. You were chief editor of the critical edition of the Alphabetum Narrationum by Arnold of Liège, a 14th century collection of 800 exemplary tales. You are the co-editor of several studies and papers and publications such as the Forum, Dante and Biography, and the Dominicans and the Making of Florentine Cultural Identity, uh, published by the Florence University Press in 2020. Finally, you were the main convener 
of the International Seminar on Critical Approaches to Dante from 2015 to 2020 here at the University of Toronto. And finally, you serve on the editorial board of the journal Dante Studies. Now your monograph, Firenze e Profeta, published in 2012, provides the comprehensive analysis of the depiction of Florence in Dante's work. And it is from this last line of inquiry that originates your latest book, co-written with the historian Giuliano Milani, Dante Vite Nuove, which is the focus of your presentation today. Now, before leaving you the floor, I would like to remind our viewers that there will be an opportunity at the end of the lecture to ask questions to Professor Brilli by clicking on the small icon at the bottom of your Zoom screen at the Q&A icon. So thank you, Professor Brilli, for being with us. You have the floor. Thank you so much, uh, Veronica, grazie. Thanks for this uh, generous introduction. I'm sincerely thrilled of participating in this series of lectures uh, today. So before starting, I would like to share my screen. Uh, I hope it works. Um, okay, so today I would like to introduce you to the problems affecting the reconstruction of uh, Dante's life. The main open questions uh, about it, as well as the main challenges uh, that uh, scholars, students, and everyday readers have to face when interested in this fascinating topic. I also would like to recall that this topic has offered the subject for a course this year at the Department of Italian Studies at the University of Toronto, uh, which was great fun, at least for me, and that this project was awarded an Insight Development Grant by the Social Sciences and Humanities Research Council in Canada. So to the Department of Italian Studies, to SHIRC, and to the Instituto Italiano di Cultura in Toronto, go my warmest uh, gratitude for their incredible support to this research and its uh, dissemination. I also would like to thank Giuliano Milani, who could not participate today, but who is hopefully attending, and Kelsey Ross uh, Cunningham, my research assistant, for helping me with the preparation of this talk. So to begin our uh, conversation this evening, I will start by recalling a key episode from the first life of Dante, the Trattatello in Laudo di Dante by Giovanni Boccaccio, an Italian author well known for his The Cameron, but who was also a keen admirer of Dante and among the first collectors of his works and of memories about him. The episode on which I will focus is a dream that Boccaccio attributes to Dante's mother, Bella, as I hope uh, it will help me to point to some important features characterizing the biographical genre, particularly about the interweaving of biography. I will then turn my attention to the tradition of studies on Dante's life, and I will share some remarks on the main changes which happened in this field over, let's say, the last uh, 20 years. And finally, I will discuss how in our most recent book that uh, you uh, recalled, Dante uh, de Vinuvelle, or in Italian, Vite Nuove, Biografia e Autobiografia di Dante, I dealt with this topic together with Giuliano Milani, who is an historian working in Paris and the co-editor of the new Codice Diplomatico Dantesco in 2016, that is the uh, commented collection of all the extant documentary evidence on Dante. So let's start uh, from a dream, a truly medieval way to begin, as we will see. In the first reduction of the uh, Trattatello, which Boccaccio put together around 1351 uh, 55, the commemoration of the life uh, of Dante is framed by the story of a prophetic dream that Bella, Dante's mother, had allegedly had just before giving birth to him. Quickly mentioned at the beginning of the Trattatello, Boccaccio returns to it at the end of his biography to explain his meaning. According to him, Bella dreamt of giving birth to her son under a very tall laurel tree near a crystalline spring. 
She then saw him feeding only on the fruit of the laurel and on water from the spring, and soon becoming a shepherd. In an attempt to reach for the branches of the tree, however, Dante falls, and once he writes himself, Bella sees him transformed into a peacock. As Boccaccio explains at the end uh, of his life, uh, the laurel, the sacred plant of Apollo, and the spring symbolize poetry and the natural and moral philosophy with which Dante was nourished from the most tender age. The figure of the shepherd, for its part, is explained as a reference to the mission of Dante, who would employ his wisdom to educate others just as doctors would. This is Boccaccio's formula. His fall, when he was about to grasp the branches of the tree, evokes his death, which occurred just as uh, he was to obtain poetic coronation, according to Boccaccio. And finally, the peacock represents the immortal fame of Dante, namely his Commedia. Then Boccaccio goes on analyzing the symbol of the peacock on which I shall return. For the moment, let's notice that Dante's mother could have not had a more appropriate dream, nor it is surprising that this is so. Boccaccio devises it by updating the classical and medieval trope of expectant mothers of illustrious men, heroes, great orders, saints, who receive premonitions as to the destiny of their unborn children. The Vita by Virgil of Donato, that is commonly considered uh, as the main source of Boccaccio's inspiration, recounts that the mother of Virgil dreamed of giving birth to a laurel branch, which then grew into a tree loaded with uh, fruit and flowers. In years closer to Dante, according to Ferreto de Ferreti, an acclaimed poet working in Verona, the mother of Cangrande della Scala, the lord of Verona and one of Dante's benefactors, dreamed of birthing a dog, which she saw climb a tall, a, a tall ladder under a rain of arrows, a clear reference to the name of her child, Can Grande, which literally means big dog, della scala of the ladder. A subsequent biographer of Dante, Filippo Villani, died in 1407, deemed the story of this dream as favolosa, a fabulous tale, and excluded it from his life of Dante. Nevertheless, Bella's dream brings to light some important truth about the genre of Dante biography. Here, as in many other efforts that Boccaccio dedicated to the safeguarding and promotion of Dante's legacy, his prudent ingenuity defends the work within the cultural landscape of his time. Let's, not, let's reconsider the lines dedicated to Dante the Shepherd. Boccaccio stretches this traditional image into different directions. On one hand, he suggests the superiority of Dante's pastoral mission to that of preachers and priests. This implies the subversion of the traditional hierarchy between lay and religious people in favor of the uh, former. If the life and work of Dante were truly animated by a defilaic, a lay challenge, as Imbach and Koenig Prolongs argued, the success in promoting Dante's lay agenda is also due to Boccaccio. On the other hand, the description of Dante in the vestment of a learned lay person recalls, as we saw, the doctors or masters of medieval universities, which Boccaccio mentions openly in the same lines. By doing this, Boccaccio consciously crafts for Dante a professional profile that, as we know now, Dante never actually held in life. A defect that prompted masters well established within academic institutions to accuse him of, among other charges, lacking any kind of scientific knowledge. One can, one can quote, for instance, Guido Bernani, a Dominican master who made a point of tearing apart Dante's political treatise, the, the Monarchia, argument by argument. Boccaccio thus neutralizes the primary eccentricity of Dante, that is, his dubious professional status. However, it is uh, through the peacock commedia complex that, Dante, that Boccaccio sorry, sharpens his arms more than with any other tool. 
Among the characteristics that medieval masteries attribute to this bird, Boccaccio focuses on four in particular and relates each to an aspect of Dante's major work. The under dyes of the peacock's plumage represent the beauty of the commedia, specifically its historia, articulated in the 100th county. The earth laden legs and the taciturn gait of this bird are related to the humility of the vernacular language, as well as to the modest style of the poem, which would justify the title of comedy. Its terribly strident call refers, nonetheless, to the frightful words with which Dante addresses both the good to educate them, as well as to the wicked to criticize them. Finally, its aromatic and incorruptible flesh alludes, according to Boccaccio, to the immortal nature of moral and theological truth contained within the poem. As it is evident by now, these characteristics of the animal work complex each respond to a risk that threatens Dante's legacy. Changing the order of the previous description, Boccaccio's subsequent analysis takes its cue from the immortal flesh of the peacock, that is, as we saw, from the great moral and theological truths that the commedia communicates. The doctrinal value of the poem is, for Boccaccio, the chief argument in favor of the conservation of Dante's work from which stems also his pastoral portrait. Equally easy becomes for him the task of defending the beauty of Dante's account about his journey through the, the afterlife, which Boccaccio presents as a pleasant fiction, quietly ignoring Dante's insistent declaration regarding both the veracity and the corporeal nature of his journey. Thirdly comes the sticky questions of the lingua, Already the object of debate during Dante's own life, this trait becomes all the more problematic after the first half of the 14th century under the Latinizing influence of Petrarch. The biographer admits the sotsura, the dirt, of the vernacular language as the feet of the peacock, something that Dante would never have conceded, but suggests that this choice ought to be taken as a sign of humility in the same way as his impretentious style manifests the poet's virtue. Only in the last instant does Boccaccio's discourse address the apostolic prophetic mission of the Commedia, the most difficult to justify to the eyes of those who paid the price of Dante's criticism. From the Florentines to the church, kings, lords, and common people denounced in the Commedia. Boccaccio recognizes his voice for what it is as an accusatory shriek, but strategically, salvages it by insisting on its educational worth, while at the same time, muting the premise that, as Dante claimed, God himself had entrusted such a mission to Dante, the character, the, the character narrator of the Commedia. So to summarize, the Pickard's characteristics are equally strategic, valuing the poem's doctrinal content, neutralizing the journey into the afterlife as a beautiful fiction, dignifying as far as possible the linguistic form and stylistic features of this vernacular work, and finally, reorienting the prophetic apostolic tone towards its function of preaching, this fabulous account rounds all the hard edges, edges of Dante's eccentricities. Now, Boccaccio certainly is not the first one to proceed in such a manner. These strategies were outlined already by other readers and commentators of the Commedia between 1320 and 1350. But it is certainly his honor to have tuned the strategies to his own cultural context, such that a new portrait of Dante emerged. In other words, Boccaccio undoes the accounts of himself that Dante had provided in order to safeguard his life and, of course, his work. At the same time, Boccaccio is certainly not the last one to proceed in such a manner. From the Trattatello, another Dante's Vita Nuova takes flight, that which, to a certain extent, has landed among us, particularly regarding the interweaving of biography and self-telling, as I anticipated. So let's try to consider Boccaccio's account of Bella's dream in another light. Must we, after what I've just said, uh, conclude that Boccaccio betrayed the legacy of Dante? 
In reality, Boccaccio is an executor much more sensitive and loyal than one might think. In the Trattatello, the promotion of Dante's vita as a matter of relevance responds to a hypothesis defined by Dante himself. Indeed, Dante set a revolutionary input in elevating his own life to literary material in all his works, which notably all revolve around his self, either under the form of first person narratives, the Vita Nuova, the story of his love as a young man for Beatrice and the story of the lost of her, and the Commedia, the story of his journey to the other world to find Beatrice back or as first-person auto-commentaries. The Vita Nuova again, for this work consists of a commented collection of a selection of Dante's first lyric output, and the Convivio, a bizarre encyclopedia of moral philosophy conceived as a commentary on Dante's moral songs. Now, such a revolutionary impulse is reflected in Boccaccio's choice to dedicate himself to the life of a man who is neither a saint, nor a hero, nor a classical author, and who, for these reasons, would never have otherwise benefited from such treatment. At the same time, the Pipcook Commedia, in which Dante transforms after his death, according to Boccaccio, is the perfect translation of Dante's dissolution of his own historical persona into his work, a phenomenon which is particularly evident in the Commedia. Bella's dream, moreover, is like an anthology of Dantean fragments. The reference to his hope of being found is a quote from Dante's latest work, The Paradiso and the Aglots. The act of describing Dante as a shepherd recalls the a simile that Dante employs to describe Virgil and Statius, as well as Dante's self-portrait as an Arcadian shepherd in the Aglots. The explanation of how a shepherd is the giver of pasture to other minds need, uh, needful of it, takes the eponymous metaphor from the convivio, the banquet of knowledge, of course. Boccaccio also draws from the same source the theme of the universality of Dante's pastoral mission, whose recipients are not only men, but youth and women. The introduction on the influence of the stars, the digression on the feeders of angels, and also the association of the prophetic apostolic dimension with an unpleasant voice, all these commands at least one instance to be found in Dante's work. So is this enough? Actually, no, we can notice more. The last editor of the Trattatello in Italy, Maurizio Fiorilla, rightly observed that to describe the awakening of Bella, Boccaccio resorts to the same formula that Dante had used for the awakening of Dante the Pilgrim in the Commedia in a key moment of the plot after fainting due to his piety for Francesca's story in Inferno V. Now, the same formula can also be found, however, in another awakening narrated by Dante. At the very beginning of his Vita Nova, Dante recounts the dream he had after he was created by Beatrice for the first time. This enigmatic vision offers a sort of clue for the rest of the narrative, and as such, it constitutes a framework for it, as it was already the case in a very famous French allegorical poem, the Roman de la Rosa, that Dante certainly had in mind. Additionally, the narrator of the Vita Nuova underlines that whereas the meaning of this dream is clear to anyone now, the readers of the Vita Nuova. At the time he had it, no one was able to unpack its message. Turning to Boccaccio in his biography of Dante, Bella's dream is given the same structural role assigned to the narrator's dream in the Vita Nuova, that of a framework. And like Dante, and by using the exact same words, Boccaccio underlines that Bella's dream was not then understood by her or anyone else, Whereas today, because of what has occurred, the significance of the portent is apparent to everyone, manifestissimo a tutti. These details suggest that Boccaccio not only reworks the commonplace of maternal visions, but also combines it with this key moment of Dante's first story about himself, Dante's first self-telling. So let me try to review what we noticed so far. 
Di Trattatello inaugurated a new genre, the biography of Dante, that continues to this very day. Notwithstanding numerous differences, this genre brings with it three features that we have just examined in Bella's dream about the peacock. First, the effort of comparatively rendering Dante within the confines of the biographer's context and eventually defending him. Second, the importance attributed to Dante's life according to Dante's own designs. And third, the difficulty of liberating oneself from the stories elaborated by Dante about himself, or to put it differently, uh, the difficulty of freeing oneself from the continuous entanglement of Dante's biography, where Dante is the object of the narrative, and Dante's self-telling, where Dante constitutes both the object and the author of the narrative. Let's address these points one by one. Since it's so when biographical research on Dante has been animated by demands to, in some way, normalize his profile by adjusting it more or less consciously to the cultural expectation of the readers. One can state that a king went to war, that a saint worked miracles, that a classical author wrote epic poetry. But what can one state about Dante, who was born in a middle-class family, never got a degree, never held a professional title, or performed a job according to archival records? The mission of the biographer then becomes to consolidate the portrait and thus rescue it from potential authoritative deficits due precisely to Dante's eccentricity. This fact is evident among pre-modern bi biographies, from Dante the Republican of Leonardo Bruni to Dante the father of the nation of Ugo Foscolo and Francesco de Santis. We must not, however, believe that such preoccupations are somehow absent from more recent biographical productions. Recurrent attempts to attribute to Dante a professional profile as a philosopher, as a theologian, a dictator, which means a professional writer of letters in medieval times, as ideologue of the white wealth or of the empire, and even as a painter, well, all of these testify to the resilience of such a dynamic in this field. In the same vein, attributing particular importance to this specific life, biographers of Dante have followed Dante's lead. And the unprecedented synergy between work and life that he himself initiated. Our biographical obsession, for lack of a better term, derives in, grand, in great part from Dante's own autobiographical passion. While Dante's vita continue to invade bookshelves, few have embraced the challenge of writing the biography of Chrétien Boutcois, the most prolific author of Arthurian poems in 12th century France, or of Brunetto Latini, Dante's master, according to Dante, and the well-known public figure of 18th century Florence, or of Cino da Pistoia, Dante's best friend after Guido Cavalcanti and the most influential jurist of his times. This trend does not stem from a lack of documentation, for indeed we would have, we would have much more material on Chino than on Dante. This trend stems from a lack of interest. Dante's life sounds interesting much more than Chrétien, Brunetto or Chino's lives. And I will argue, this biased perception is largely due to the fact that Dante did not cease talking about himself in his works, whereas Chrétien, Brunetto, and Chino almost never did. Finally, Dante's self-telling uh, self still exerts a strong influence on the study of his life. For biographers, it is extremely difficult to resist the temptation to generate a collage between information regarding Dante's life and his own declarations about it. While we may believe ourselves immune to risks of this nature, it is a fact that contemporary biographies are no less fixated on the nobility of the Alighieri family or on Dante's traviamento, his moral crisis after Beatrice's death, or on the break between Dante and the banished white wealth, that is, on events which belong above all to Dante's own telling of himself. 
Now, I know that these statements might sound surprising given the novelties in this field over the last 20 years. Allow me to quickly recap what has happened, knowing that what we witnessed was a major turning point. In the last decades, two major biographies have radically questioned our certainties about Dante's life. On the one hand, a biography by Marco Santagata, translated into English by Dixon in 2016. On the other, the one by Giorgio Inglese, 2015, who also had already provided a philological revision of and a commentary on the Commedia. Suddenly, readers discovered more gaps and doubts about Dante's life than certainties, which was the social profile of Dante's family which ground had his claims of being the great grandson of a crusader who was also a knight, Cachaguida. Was Dante truly noble or was this a lie? Are the references he makes to his weak health, weak health in his poetry the sign of some illness? Was he narcoleptic or did he suffer from epilepsy? How did he happen to start his political career in Florence? Why did the white Guelph chose him? Did they appoint him as a sort of spokesman for their party? And did he deserve being banished? And why did he break up with them sometime after his exile? And where did he write his works? And when did he move to Verona? And of course, I could go on until tomorrow and the day after. Now, Sant'Agata filled these gaps with new working hypotheses, often inspired by Umberto Carpi, building up a seducing narrative revolving around the notion of political opportunity. Is Dante was a man not only deeply involved in politics, but whose works, including the Commedia, were composed in reaction to the latest news, to take position and eventually to take advantage from favorable circumstances. Inglis instead developed a synthetic reassessment of all the literary and documentary evidence also for the purpose of reminding us about the distinction between facts and conjectures. Besides, this con Dante's contrasting lives were nothing but a drop in the ocean of new historical studies on Dante. Such a biographical flow was the climax of a wider historical turn in the field. By this definition, I refer to a variety of enterprises which being neither part of a predetermined strategy nor completely unrelated, the one from the others, have contributed to putting the relationship between literature and history at the very center of this research field. And I apologize for not having the time of recalling all these studies one by one, but we can talk, of course, of this in the Q&A. So to set the discussion within a broader historiographical and methodological framework, in 2018, Dante Studies, the Journal of the Dante Society of America, decided to devote its first forum to the topic Dante and Biography, which I coordinated and to which many colleagues from different disciplines took part and whose contributions were exceptionally vital for my own reflection. Thanks to this forum, it appeared evident that the time had come to try to define a new form of biographical inquiry and narrative this first impression was confirmed by the most recent publications. Even if these new studies, which are all extremely valuable, integrated the best outcomes of this historical turn, including the forum I've just mentioned, nevertheless, they went on proposing rather traditional forms of biographical account. The intellectual biography, for instance, a, a genre already well-practiced, or the classical biography, reassessing and combining sources of various kinds, something which have already been attempted with different results and the sort of comprehensible tendency to prioritize aspects which are more of the biograph biographer's sorry, interest than relevant to understanding Dante. And even what I'd call the ultra historical biography, this happens when one tries to recount the life of Dante as a man among others, which is to say as if Dante was not the author of the Commedia, an ultra historical endeavor, one might think, but which actually turns to be anti-historical because in all honesty, no one would have ever cared 
about Dante's life if it, was, if it was not the author of his works. Better, no one would have ever been interested in his life if it wasn't Dante who had prompted us to consider it important because of his self-telling. This one is one of the main historical novelties of Dante, for, as I've already mentioned, medieval authors do not usually speak of their lives. And by the way, this is also a compelling and topical subject for us who belong to a very different context, which has well proved the striking power as well as the dangers of self-representations, storytelling and self-telling. So how can one investigate at the same time Dante's life and his accounts of it? or better, the intricate knot constituted by these two different but forever linked stories. The path that uh, Giuliano Milani and I followed is the offspring of a long interdisciplinary dialogue. Our aim was not only to distinguish proved facts from conjectures, but also to study each evidence individually and within its own context. On one hand, the life of Dante, which emerges from a cover records. On the other, the stories about himself that Dante constantly elaborated, adapted, and renewed throughout his life. And then to put these two stories in dialogue to shed light on the connections and resonances between them. The main question for us was how did experience fashioned Dante's perception of himself and how did his self-representations vice versa, contributed to the shaping of his own life. This is the reason why a chapter of our book is divided into two parts, one devoted to the history written by Giuliano Milani, and the other one to the self-telling which I authored. Furthermore, as I mentioned, biographies of Dante usually consist of a collage of sources of various kinds due to the habit of filling the void about a certain moment of Dante's life by drawing information from the declaration he would make various, year, various years later and for completely different reasons. For instance, the void about his adolescence are filled by referring to the Vita Nuova, written when he was already almost 30 years old or the doubts about the first years after his banishment from Florence are reconstructed on the basis of the county by Caccia, of Cacciaguida in the Paradiso, in which Dante will recount this story, but after more than a decade since he left Florence and in a completely different political climate. For our part, we dismissed this combinatory approach in favor of a comparative approach allowing us to confront and contrast what Dante experienced in a certain time with the accounts he provided of himself during the same time span. This means that we examine not only the contents of Dante's stories, uh, of the stories that Dante retells, but all about himself, but their making. As to a friend who recounts to us his story various times and at each time in different manners, we would ask not only what happened, but why he is adjusting his tale. In the same way, we interrogated Dante. In other words, we have done our best to resist succumbing to the power of Dante's self-narratives by refusing to consider them exclusively as biographical sources, but rather as objects of study and thereby of history in their own right. Finally, the lives of Dante present usually the material in a pseudo chronological order by dedicating a chapter to a specific stylistic or intellectual phase or to the places where Dante lived, perhaps, or to his works. Such a structure has the limits of presenting a certain, a certain sorry, what often is only hypothetical and thus of predetermining the interpretation of every detail. We preferred instead to subdivide his life into broad periods conventionally defined according to the scheme of the ages of men, which Dante also quoted in his convivio by distinguishing an, an adolescence up to the 25 years, a maturity or youth from 25 to 55, 45, an old age from 45 to 70, and finally a senility, the remaining part of one's life. 
However, we adapted the scheme to the specific of Dante's existence, which lasted no longer than 56 years, and whose youth is split between the before and the after of his departure from Florence in 1302, which we place at the exact midpoint of our book. Working by temporal segments as sweeping as possible has enabled us to offer a synoptic vision of the data available for each one, such that new consideration, questions, and fundamental tendencies might uh, emerge. The last of these choices is especially manifest, I think, in the fact of having uh, taken a step back from some questions that, while canonical in this field, are in reality generated by a centuries-old short circuit between the life of Dante and his accounts of himself. And I have already mentioned various of those, the Traviamento, the break from the white glove, and so forth. At the same time, these roles have led us to read in a new light the data at our disposal and to posit a holistic sense of Dante's trajectory, rather than focusing on specific erudite details, for instance, the date of his arrival in a certain city, which not only we will probably never be able to conclusively establish, but also, even if we could, would not perhaps change much uh, our understanding of Dante's life and our understanding of his contribution to Western history. This investigation, as I hope, instead brought us to reread essential aspects of this double story, that of Dante's life and that of Dante's account of it. From the side of his life, and here I'm, I will hastily summarize uh, Milani's findings, the element that most differentiates Dante's existence from that of his contemporaries is the absence of a professional status and more generally of any definite social position established once and for all. Such an absence makes it difficult to assign him to any of the groups squaring off with each other in Florence. This lack of professional identity will also cause his footsteps to seemingly vanish after his banishment. Yet the position of Dante, a definitely eccentric one by social norms of his time, gave him access to the multiple educational resources of his cultural context without the rigidity inherent to professionalized scopes of study and practice. Milani rewrites in, this light, uh, in the light of this eccentricity, also Dante's political career and subsequent life. While his work definitely establishes Dante's full participation in the party of the White Gloves during his years in Florence, a participation which also includes questionable but historical rather usual forms of hegemony making and political struggle, he also insists on the precariousness of Dante's position within this group. Particularly for the long years of his exile, against the temptation to interpret his movements as a presumed sign of his adherence to this or that political party, and in contrast to the opposite tendency to, of rendering Dante as an isolated hero, he focuses the story of a man who, in an incredibly complex and shifting political landscape, tries to earn his living through his rhetorical abilities and his broad knowledge, however, with inconsistent results, which also explains the fluidity of this trajectory. When one considers instead Dante's account of himself, the first salient fact to be pointed out is a sense of profound continuity through even contradictory rewritings of his life. The approach, the main sources as textual devices employed with the goal of constructing himself remain more or less identical throughout the course of his life. Claims of his own exceptionalism also remain stable as does the ambition to construct a community for himself through writing. These characteristics can be easily explained as the effects of Dante's overinvestment of himself in literary activities since his 20s, and as a consequence of his need to justify this life choice in a social and cultural context, such as the late medieval one, which still does not envision the fact of being a writer as a professional option. Only on this continual basis do breaks become apparent. During his youth in Florence, the discovery of a philosophical and doctrinal horizon, already in the Vita Nuova, fits Dante's 
to secure both his poetry and a prominent role for himself in the public space. After 1302, his banishment induces him to reread himself and to reread already familiar literary works with a new perspective. At first, in the Vulgar Eloquenza and the Convivio, as well as in other writings of this time, Dante reacts by denouncing the injustice to which he had been subjected, but also through two other strategies, putting in value as much as possible his previous literary production and attempting to conform himself to a consolidated cross-section of prestigious social cultural figures. On both accounts, the game is the same, striving to activate a virtuous cycle through the conflation of his persona, his writings, and the powerful players with whom he is in contact. For reasons we will never know, such projects were never finished. It is however possible that in the initial conception, the Commedia belonged to this same trend, as an epic poem showcasing him as an exemplary redeemed sinner and devised as a sort of encyclopedia of moral philosophy in a narrative form. Its developments, however, go way beyond this project. The polarizing experience of Henry VII expedition, as well as a more acute awareness of his capacity as a writer, provokes a new adaptation of his account of himself. From that point onward, Dante's self-telling becomes decidedly authoritative in confirming his apostolic mission and the Commedia, which bears the marks of these adjustments, evolves into a secret poem composed following up a divine investiture. Also, we, also, we always considered the case of Dante from a broader perspective, this is the history of Western selfhood and of writing of the self. As I mentioned, the elaboration of Dante in this regard accompanies all his life and all his works, including the Commedia, and constitutes an important historical novelty for medieval times. No late author prior to Dante offers an equally rich autobiographical workshop. Playing with relatively limited number of sources of inspiration, as well as on typological paradigms that he reshapes time and time again, Dante succeeds at putting himself at the center of his own textual universe. He thus crafts a trajectory that puts into even more relief his historic, uh, historical individuality, from the nameless, weakly defined identity of the protagonist narrator of the Vita Nuova, to that strongly connoted in an individual sense of the paradiso. Obviously, this path is not linear and even full of contradictions and wrinkles, principally because of the coexistence of several strategies of narrative subjectification. Moreover, its destination is intimately paradoxical. Nata's final affirmation of himself coincides not only with his investiture as spokesman of God, but also with the dissolution of his historical persona in the works he ordered. He became the story he told about himself. He became a peacock. Nevertheless, and I'm going to conclude, Dante manages to secure a completely original space for his own individuality, ultimately consigned to posterity as a sign impossible to forget. Understanding how this comes to pass, is an open question, but the cross-examination of his literary path and of his life path can help us to, rise to, the, uh, rise to the challenge. Of course, the factors that we allied in this book do not explain everything. Nothing can explain everything. What remains is that a Florentine of middle-class extraction and of a largely self-taught education would go on to revolutionize forever, not only the history of literature, but more broadly, the history of the selfhood and of the role played by an author's life in Western culture. This is, together with Dante's life, the history that our Vita Nuove new lives recount. And this is also the reason for choosing to decline Dante's well-known title, Vita Nuova, at the plural. If I may share a final uh, remark, Bella's dream has certainly proven to be prophetic. 
700 after Dante's last metamorphosis, the peacock continues somehow to spread its feathers to the wonder and to the enchantment of its reader. Thank you very much for your attention. Thank you, Professor Brilli. That was very intriguing to analyze the life of the peacock, Dante. <laughs> I would like to invite uh, our viewers to submit any questions uh, they may have regarding uh, this, um, this you know, life of Dante and the biography of Dante as it has been presented by uh, Professor Brilli. Now, I do actually have, I, may I ask a very first question? Of course. I'm because sorry, I realized only now that uh, we had some audio problems. Uh, yes, uh, sometimes, unfortunately, your, the audio was a little skipping. Oh, I'm sorry. I didn't look in the chat. Sorry. But it's fine. Well, um, as uh, no, Dante is one of the paramount uh, writers, and as you said, philosophers, um, maybe with an apostolic mission, but definitely um, it, an embodiment of a typical medieval uh, writer. And, in, and as exactly as you said, and as was suggested by the Trattatello di Boccaccio, there is a quite a strong symbolism in uh, the depiction uh, or description uh, of life and you know, occurrences in life by a medieval author. Now, do you think that um, Dante, I mean, of course, there's quite a lot of self-telling in his, as you said, in his works, not just the commedia, but do you think there's also, is it difficult maybe to separate sometimes the symbolism, so the message, the symbolic message that Dante wants to convey from actual uh, facts and actual, um, truth that he wants to uh, transmit. Mm -hmm. Yeah, totally. It is extremely difficult to, to, to make this operation for uh, one reason is because at some point of his life, but quite early, Dante thought that his persona, so his life, could have been a way, if retold, to vehiculate his message. And in this way, create a conflation of uh, his life or a declaration about his life and the message itself. Uh, this is the reason why I think that uh, Boccaccio's example is interesting because it shows very well how at the very beginning of the genre, uh, there was the a reaction to this operation made by Dante. So basically uh, an author like Boccaccio and many other biographers will do the same afterwards. They will change the contents if you want of the message. So Dante is no more uh, a prophet, he becomes a doctor, as I explained in the case of Boccaccio, he will become a Republican new Cicero in the case of uh, uh, Leonardo Bruni, he will become the father of the nation and so on. In that way, uh, biographers are changing the contents of the message, but what they cannot change is the way in which Dante conflated his persona with its message. And from there stems the necessity of rewriting his life continually. Mm -hmm. And this is true for Dante, but this is also true for the subsequent uh, tradition of studies. And this is the reasons why in this book, we try to approach the question from a completely different angle and to disentangle these two stories. So the life from, as we may know it from uh, documents and mm -hmm. the life as Dante retold it and actually created it in his works. Right. And I have another question, and this is really out of curiosity. Mm -hmm. um, you said, of course, we have a lot of elements, biographical elements for Dante from other writers that wrote about him, commencing from Boccaccio, of course, himself and his self-telling, but how much of it is also just plain documents that could uh, you know, you know, that could explain uh, his life and his biography. Are there, uh, it seems to me, there's not quite enough documents uh, or in the archives, Florentine archives or 
you know, Ferrara or wherever he, he, he happened to be, to actually pinpoint exactly um, his life and the different chapters in his life. Totally, you're, you're totally right. Everything which is available now is available in this um, Codice Diplomatico Dantesco, which I was mentioning at the beginning, and that uh, Giuliano and others credited. Uh, and this is a very useful work because uh, something very difficult for, for us lay people who are not historian is how to read these documents. Uh, right. One good example is uh, we have some records of that uh, that Dante at some point made. Um, and these have been usually interpreted as signs of, um, you know, a troubled financial situation. Actually, when historian of debts read them, they, they know that they, they were part of a financial operation. So uh, they meant actually the opposite thing. But you are totally right that uh, in the case of Dante, we have um, less documents than what we would. Uh, we would like to have, and this is the reason why traditionally every biography uh, works in the way I defined as a collage or combination. So we try to put together not the statements, the documents we have, the ancient biographies and so on, and to reconstruct what is the most likely. Uh, we did something different because Giuliano Milani as an historian tried to think about this lack of documents, or if you want these uh, voids and sources as historical signs. And something important when we look at medieval documentation is that only some categories of people uh, may leave uh, documentary evidences. And these are the people who either create the documentation, notaries, uh, institutions, and so on, or the people who are referred into the documentation. So that the fact that someone like Dante, for instance, in the last years of his life, left only two documentary uh, records, basically means that uh, he wasn't part of any of these networks. So it becomes, if you want, it becomes an historical evidence uh, from the negative point mm -hmm. of view. And this is also what finally allows us to exclude uh, and I would like to be clear about that because there are still uh, many mm, different visions in Dante studies to exclude that he had any official uh, office as a chancellor, for instance, because a chancellor would let leave some, at least some documents, uh, which wow. wasn't the case of okay. Dante. Thank you. Uh, there is a question by Lorenzo De Loso. Mm -hmm. And uh, you can probably find it in the Q&A section. I can read it to you. Uh, I would prefer because I'm not sure I can see the Q&A section. Say, my question is, does your biography broadly consider the cultural context in which Dante wrote and spread his works, even though the poet was not necessarily influenced by such context? And we do not have evidence of it yet. Some examples, the mendicant convents in Florence, the university doctors in Bologna, the Biblioteca Capitolare in Verona, et cetera, et cetera. Mm -hmm. As you know very well, even if there is no direct connection with the work of Dante, the study of the cultural context can tell us a lot about the spread of a specific work into a specific context. And or can you tell us whether some of the position Dante defended into his in, in his works were somehow different or similar to those defended by specific intellectuals elite, again, into specific intellectual context. Sorry, this is a very question uh, maybe it should have been in two. Um, thanks for, for reading it. Uh, grazie, uh, Lorenzo, for, for this question. Uh, so yes and no, in the sense that, yes, totally, when, when I was saying before that we tried to, to consider each evidence in its individuality and in its context, this is exactly uh, what I meant. So uh, we try to make room for uh, political history, institutional history, and of course, also cultural history as the examples you, uh, you made. Then, of course, in a biography, it's impossible to get too much uh, into details. Uh, because uh, of the genre, uh, this is not the place to, to make uh, verifications uh, of details. Huh? Uh, 
this is comprehensible, but I think you and other readers will find uh, something interested, uh, interesting about the mendicant orders and particularly the way in which uh, Giuliano suggests to reread the transition between the philosophical theological phase of Dante's formation and the beginning of his uh, political career, particularly by considering the network, which was uh, at the time relied the uh, convent of Santa Maria Novella, which of course uh, interests me uh, as well, and the, um, the commune. Hmm? Uh, mm -hmm. So specifically in the, the first, uh, around the half of the 90s uh, in Florence, I, I apologize with the other um, people connected if I'm getting too much into details, but specifically around the, the 90s, uh, the, the connection between the new popular um, trend uh, in political institution and the Dominican order were extremely important. So this is for the mendicant orders. Uh, uh, the two other examples uh, which were mentioned, well, I, I forget about them. Uh, the Biblioteca Capitolare di Bellorona and the other one you mentioned, uh, Bologna. Yes. Uh, yeah, again, I'm speaking as if uh, I were uh, Giuliano Milani, which I'm not. So I apologize if I say things which are uh, not totally correct. But in the case of Bologna uh, and the context at the University of Bologna, Indeed, uh, we, we explored it and we, we make reference to it. But at the same time, uh, Giuliano tries to envision the stay of Dante in Bologna in a different way from what is traditional huh? and to uh, reread it in the context of what was normal for uh, a member of the upper class of the popolo, such as Dante uh, in his youth at this time. Uh, in the case of the uh, Biblioteca Capitolare di Verona, yes, we, we make some references, but uh, there are many other stu studies in this moment. I'm thinking particularly about Pellegrini's uh, work, which could be uh, consulted for further uh, details. Thank you. I hope Lorenzo. So, if is there any other question from our viewers? And oh. One second, they arrived. Lorenzo says, thank you. <laughs> and Sanda says, Elisa, thank you for explaining the brilliant methodology for the study of Dante's life that you and your colleague elaborated. I'm particularly impressed by the description of Dante as something of a, a man without a place, no fixed professional or social status. It cannot be a coincidence that your, your, your work you, that you work on another important figure you narrate, narrated, Saint August, Saint Agostino. Can we understand uh, why narrating his life would have been so attractive to Dante if so few other figures of his time engaged in this exercise? Mm -hmm. Well, the, 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 this is all the point. Uh, thank you, Sandra, for, for this question. This is all the point of my part. So the part on the, on the self-telling. Uh, in the book, I try to, to highlight um, different uh, aspects. And I would say there are uh, three uh, main uh, factors uh, to, to consider to uh, explain uh, Dante's case, even though, um, as I was saying at the end, it's impossible to, you know, to totally explain it because it's an exception. Uh, and I would like to, 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 to underline this fact uh, once more. Um, the, the three factors that uh, we considered are the, uh, the fact that since his um, adolescence, so it, since his, his, his 20s, uh, Dante certainly was uh, aware and deeply aware, so very familiar with some production in, of the uh, French literature, uh, such as the Roman de la Rose and others, mm -hmm. uh, which are now acknowledged, uh, thinking about the works by Michel Zanck, as the laboratory for the uh, development of a new, uh, I think the term that Sank uses, um, subjectivité littéraire, so a new literary subjectivity, which does not, which is not autobiographical yet, huh? but is a work on putting in value the uh, self huh? as a, as a place of reflection. 
then uh, quite early, and this is something that Dante records in all his works, uh, he started reading the classical authors of late uh, antiquity, so the masters of the selfhood, such as St. Augustine that you mentioned, and Boetius. And of course, this was totally enlightening for him, and these are also the models to which he explicitly uh, makes uh, reference to in his work as, uh, you know, the models who would authorize his enterprise of uh, self-telling. Uh, this happens in the convivio. And finally, there are biographical reasons. Uh, so something that I try to underline in this study is that uh, someone like Dante starts writing a lot and uh, quite early. And he does so with such an investment and such um, a passion, if you want, that uh, somehow for him, it seems that the, the place and the role commonly given and the knowledge to literary activity changed. Uh, so for the others, writing poetry was um, an hobby, uh, if we can put it like that. Whereas for Dante, it becomes everything. And when it becomes everything, well, you need to find ways to justify what you're doing. And for Dante, talking about himself and trying to give meaning to his own experience is also not only a reflection on his um, self, but also a way to uh, legitimize his own activity. And I think that this is something evident already in Di Vita Nuova. Mm -hmm. Thanks. Sanda also uh, um, added a, another small uh, mm -hmm. question, the peacock. It was really, <laughs> is, there a is there a trace of vanity or did I miss what I was obvious? I mean, so is the, the peacock also a symbol Mm -hmm. of vanity. Mm -hmm. uh, the, the, this element is not so present, uh, I hope I'm not wrong, but it's not so present in medieval vestries about the peacock. Right. Uh, even though uh, in some cases uh, we found uh, mentions of proud, huh? uh, but uh, Boccaccio didn't make it explicit. So in the vestries, as it is always the case, um, to each animal are attributed many different features and Boccaccio intentionally focuses only on four of all the uh, features possible mm -hmm. for, for a peacock. So yeah, perhaps that um, among the lines, between the lines, one can also read a reference to Dante well-known pride and sense of himself, uh, but this is not make, you know, made explicit by, by Boccaccio in this passage. Fantastic. Now we do have a one last question from Albert Deigen mm -hmm. and slightly off topic. Okay. I, I studied Dante with Antonio D'Andrea at McGill mm -hmm. in the late 60s and early 70s. The edition of La Divina Commedia that we read was edited by Ciro Ximenez, mm -hmm. published by Unione Tipografica e Torino. I'd be curious to know whether it is still considered author authoritative or it has been superseded, in your opinion? The, the commentary, um, I, I use it from time to time, uh, but it's true that now uh, is not so uh, well spread or used anymore. Uh, something which is extremely useful, and I always tell it to, to everyone. I mean, <laughs> Dante scholars, of course, know, uh, Dante students as well, but common readers uh, should know as well, is that uh, the, um, there is this wonderful uh, website by the, uh, I think this is the Dante Dharma's College. Uh, mm. So it's the Dharma's College who, who created it, uh, from which it's possible to consult all the ancient commentators on the comedy and a, a wide selection of modern uh, commentaries on the comedy. And so in case of doubt, uh, and if one wants to also to follow the stories of some glosses, which is a fascinating topic, uh, this is a wonderful tool, tool to use. But yeah, in the case of Shimans, I would say that is not uh, so uh, much used, uh, but you know, it's part of the story of this thing. So new commentaries are made uh, and the previous one are uh, somehow forgotten. But thanks to this website, uh, it's possible for everyone to, to check also on these previous uh, works. And sometimes they are full of um, useful, suggestions. 
Fantastic. Actually, I will um, share, thank you, Daniel Malan. Mm -hmm. I will share the, um, the website to all, with all our, um, with all our attendees. Mm -hmm. And it's right here in the chat. Oops. One second, let me see if I can do this. Technologically challenged. <laughs> and all right. There it is. So it's from Dartmouth. Mm -hmm. Well, Professor Elisa Brilli, thank you so much. It was fascinating. It, it really, you know, we, as probably all our viewers know, Dantes is um, mandatory in our, in the Italian school system. Throughout our high school system, uh, we study it. But uh, really, you opened up uh, quite a few doors that um, really also gave a different perspective on Dante's life and his biography. So I thank you very, very much for your um, lecture today. And I see here there are also coming quite a few thank yous from our audience. Uh, thank you all of you for attending this um, lecture. And I will actually just a little a marketing moment for the Instituto. I will uh, invite you all to please follow um, our website for our upcoming events. Again, uh, the pandemic is forcing us to hold all our uh, lectures, um, conferences and um, events online. However, I've really noticed that we also by the number of um, viewers we had, it is also an opportunity for many people to follow uh, our cultural program. Also, not just in Toronto and Ontario, but from Canada, from the US, and sometimes even from Italy. Thank you so much, Elisa. Grazie, yeah. Veronica. Grazie a tutti. Thank you for your time and attention. Thank you. Bye-bye.